Mm -hmm. have the record. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, welcome everyone to our second Earth Month uh, webinar. Uh, this week, we are focusing on eco adventures, adventures at Shades Mountain Elementary School with Nancy McGowan, who was our BEEP Award winner at in the Environmental Education Association's conference for all that they are doing at Shades Mountain Elementary School. So we are very happy to have her here today. We, um, this webinar is being sponsored by Legacy, Partners in Environmental Education. And uh, Legacy was created back in 1992 by a group of individuals who wanted to provide quality fact-based environmental education materials to the citizens of Alabama. So the organization brings together state, federal agencies, businesses, environmental groups, associations, and concerned citizens to provide comprehensive environmental education programs without duplicating the efforts of other organizations. So we pull the state together for environmental education. So its goal is to operate as a true partnership of all groups that are interested in environmental education and to develop a balanced environmental education program. And um, we get support basically from our tag. You see our legacy tag at the top of the screen. So when you buy your tag this year, get your tag renewal, consider uh, purchasing the legacy tag to support our programs. We do get other monies from partnership programs, donations from those who are, who are our individual partners. So you're welcome to join as a partner on our website. And uh, we get in-kind donations, grants, and special events. Our website is located at the bottom of this slide. So please uh, um, Click on that when you get a chance and look over some of the programs that we have, the workshops that are being offered um, throughout this month, next month, and on into the summer, and um, join them if you're interested. So welcome today. So let's get started with Ms. McGowan. Thank you, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Klon. Um, this is Eco Adventures and it's citizen science for your K through five classroom. As Dr. Robinson said, my name is Nancy McGowan and I am a gifted specialist for Hoover City Schools. Um, for, I know we have a few folks here. So just if you can unmute or in the chat, just tell me who you are and also what grade level you teach or what your capacity of education is. And if you see me looking to the right, turning my head away, then uh, that just means I'm looking over here at the chat. I know that um, there are also men in the chat, but I just wanna make sure that I can see as well. Okay, so K-12 science. Jennifer, what grade do you teach? Uh, there we go, oh, nice, okay. All right, and then Ms. Von Cannell is uh, our assistant principal. Great. So the next question is, what level of engagement are you hoping for your students? And before you get to that, let me kind of explain what I mean. Um, I teach school-wide enrichment, and so we have different levels of enrichment activities. And so if we're talking about a level one, this is going to be one that's going to be sparking interest. It could be a single event. It could be a class period. It could just be Earth Day. And I know that we're talking about Earth Day for this month of series of, of videos. Um, level two, for this one, it's more teacher guided. Um, we're developing student independence and leadership, typically within a whole group setting, but you may have some small group activities. Um, this is also occurring over a longer period of time, or might you choose level three? This is student directed, and it really comes out of your level two activities or learning processes. Um, this is moving towards PBL, problem-based learning, and the teacher is more the facilitator the 
activities are student directed. Um, it's very specific with goals, which usually includes collaboration with or connection to outside entities. And the time frame is going to vary. So in the chat, if you could tell me, are you a level one? I just want a quick in and out. Level two, you really want to uh, make sure that you're guiding students or is it level three? What would you choose? Thank you, Michael. And there's nothing wrong with level one activities because sometimes we do want something that's just gonna be really enjoyable and fun. It might be a special day. Okay, two and three. Okay, perfect. Great, great, great. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, we're gonna talk about what citizen science is. A real simple definition from National Geographic is that citizen science is the practice of public participation and collaboration in scientific research to increase scientific knowledge. And you're generally sharing this with the professionals because there are not enough professional scientists to gather all the data. And so they're looking for individuals who can provide this data there by citizen science. And so we really want our kids involved in that. Um, standards and uh, your audits or inventories. So each of the programs are rooted in real world experiences that I'm getting ready to show you. Therefore, you will not have to worry about which standards will align. Uh, you will have a plethora of standards from all subject areas, including technology, which will align with the grade level or levels you are instructing. Um, the thought of beginning sometimes seems like you're trying to take a sip out of a fire hose. Um, you can't make the experience, um, you're, you're just kind of overwhelmed with it, but you can make this bite-sized and you can also truly have a laser focus for your students by conducting audits and inventories that are, are made. But what we're gonna do first of all is we're gonna talk about some level one because I think this is really important. <clears throat> and also just know that the activities that we're talking about and the programs that I'm gonna introduce you to, you can go big, you can have it really small, you can do it as a class, you can do it as a collaboration, you can also do face-to-face -face or you can do online. So that's some of our cute little Shades Mountain folks um, doing a biodiversity audit. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. And if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat or just unmute yourself and um, I will answer if I can. So the first one that I wanna show you guys is BioBlitz. And this is a great one. I'm gonna pull this up. So first of all, what is a BioBlitz? This is when you go outside and you're getting uh, information about the different animals and um, plants within your area. And you can see here that the BioBlitz what I'm trying to make sure is that you understand that you are not alone in doing this. You're going, oh my goodness, what in the world is this? How do I do it? Know that you can get started. There are video tutorials. Uh, there are also BioBlitz guides and a teacher guide. It will walk you through every bit of how to do a BioBlitz. And we have done one of these um, at a, a previous school and it was amazing. We had all the kids involved and it was, um, it was very interesting because many of the kids don't have an opportunity to get outside and be in nature. So um, it was also a great way to organize and connect with our parents. Next, let's look at in just a minute. Okay, so let me pause this. This is a video from um, Alabama Pals and it's People Against a Littered State. And we just wanna show you a quick segment of this. Jamie Mitchell is the coordinator for this program and she is great and wonderful. Um, so quick portion of the video. Okay, 
So just wanted you to see a little bit of that. That's the silly part. It's really funny, very engaging for kids, which is really what you want. But then it moves into exactly what's happening when you're tossing something out the window and why you really want to make sure that we're not littering and what the overall environmental impact is. Um, let me take you to their site. So they actually have a statewide campaign and um, Jamie is helping us out this year because we have some materials that are coming in, but they have an annual Earth Day type activity. Don't drop it on Apple, Alabama is this month's, but you can see her contact information there and um, just the fact that they have a lot of resources on their site that you can use. So I would definitely encourage that one as a, let's get in, let's try something, let's get people involved, um, and then look at your standards and see how you can expand that so that you can then um, do a lot more with whatever age kids you have. Um, this one will not apply to you, Jennifer. Um, I was kind of shooting for K through 12, but if you happen to have any third graders within your district. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie Plants, the Cabbage Program is a wonderful resource to have. Um, I like this one, not just as an Earth Day celebration activity, but because of the value of the program. Um, it is just for third grade, but Bonnie Plants has expanded to the deliveries to where we have now a fall and a winter delivery. They give you a self-contained, uh, nicely wrapped up, cabbage plant and it's huge. So it gives the kids a nine week span of lessons and it takes them through the growing process. So you can not only incorporate science, you can look at math, um, you can look at uh, all types of reading, literature connected to this. Um, but the one thing that I really enjoy is the fact that they focus on how you can plant it in different areas. You can plant it outside. They also have container growing because if you have a lot of students with, that are apartment dwellers and they feel like they're left out because they can't plant something. Um, this is also a great opportunity to use the lesson plans that deal with the connection between food deserts, food insecurity, and the nutritional value of fresh produce. So there's a lot of value here. It could even go into social and emotional, um, but I, I just really enjoy the Bonnie Camp Plants program. And we have been involved in this for at least 10 years. So, okay. So now we're getting down to the type twos and type threes <clears throat> or level two and level three. With any one of the programs, I would strongly suggest conducting an audit. And um, give me just a minute to pull this up. And Eco Schools is the program that I use for an umbrella. This is where my jumping off point is. And Eco Schools is one that we've also used to um, make us kind of a springboard for Green Ribbon. And what you're going to see is that there are a variety of audits and a variety of pathways. And as I mentioned, we were working on biodiversity. And you can also see that you have bands for K through two, three through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. Let me just pull up the one on biodiversity and that way you can just see, um, I'll go to the three through five. You always do a baseline audit and then you also do a post audit, but it gives you a variety of questions so that you can really focus on, well, what is it that I want to learn? What is it that I want my children to get out of this particular study? With the biodiversity audit, you're not only using Google Earth to map out the dimensions of your area, uh, your campus, you're also trying to find a sample spot that is gonna be representative of the area that you have there. And then it gives you questions and it asks for things like latitude and longitude, asks for uh, the type of surface area, 
Um, you're also going to be taking a picture of it. Uh, they're asking you to figure out the area, what's the perimeter, and then your students go out and you're looking at the categories, the tree or the shrub, plants or fungus, birds, animals, and vertebrates, amphibians, reptiles, and fish, and you're going to calculate all of this in the sample site. Once again, this is just a sample. This is not your entire campus, so please don't go, oh my goodness, how in the world am I ever going to do that? You are just looking at a certain percentage, and based on that, you can have some great discussions because we were talking about, um, kids were saying, is this an invertebrate? Um, you know, and so we go, well, you know what, we need to go look that up. Um, the different types of birds that we have, that was amazing. Um, you're also looking to see if, you know, quality of life, do we have ones that are alive or are they no longer alive? So I wanted you guys to see one of the audits here. Um, I, I think this is a fabulous way to start. And now we're going to move on to other areas. So Nancy, before you move on, let me ask you a question. How do you, uh, how do you get the uh, longitude and latitude? Is there a link to find that? Do they use GIS or what? I'm so glad you asked. When you pull up your address on Google Earth, it will automatically give you the lat latitude and longitude of your address. Okay. Isn't okay. that cool? Yes, yeah, so from Google Earth. Okay, yes. so there's a link on this um, this document to Google Earth. I may have missed that part. <laughs> no, I did not put the link there, but I can. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I was just asking, was it link? It's not on the document. You just go to Google Earth and put in your address. Oh, you mean, okay, I understand now. So you're asking, yes, it is linked here. So right. Okay. Now, yes, yes. There's Google Earth. Okay. I missed it. it. <laughs> yep. And if you've never used Google Earth before, uh, this is a great step into technology. Uh, and, and the kids more than likely have, but it, it really is um, very interesting. Um, and it can take you in a whole other direction there. So yeah, thank you. I love that. Google Earth. It's yes. the, I love looking up addresses and stuff on there. <laughs> but. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Okay, so let me go to my next one, which is um, our Eco Schools Carbon Calculator. So we did our audit uh, pre-COVID, it was about 2019. And in this, you have, I'm gonna pull this up right here. It's a ready-made spreadsheet. So it's so easy to use. Um, what you're going to do is, and let me pull this out of the way. At the very bottom, you're going to see the electricity information. And you can use the national or you can go to your state's information. And I pulled up Alabama's and it was really easy to use. If your children are not comfortable using percentages, then that would be a math activity that you could go to. Um, but each one of the classrooms, you are inventorying each one. And so we had our fourth graders to go throughout the school and they inventory every single classroom. So this is one classroom audit. And you're gonna notice that there are several tabs. I hope you guys can see at the bottom down here. If you cannot, I'm just gonna read them off. It says electricity information, which is what you're seeing right now, classroom lighting. I'll click on over to there, hopefully it will work. Energy vampires. So this is another great discussion. These are things that are just plugged in, but either they, don't need to be plugged in all the time or you're leaving a plug in the socket and then you're unplugging like if you have ipads or if you have some type of um, dot and dash or anything and you just leave the plug plugged in the outlet but you unplug the object then that's called an energy vampire because it's still pulling power if you have a lamp plugged in and or you know power strips those are energy vampires because they're still taking energy and you just have to think well do i need to have them plugged in all the time um, other appliances um, classroom paper so you can pick and choose whichever ones you want but the purpose in this is we're making our kids aware of their carbon footprint and we're trying to figure out 
okay, where are we right now, part of our inventory, and then what is it that I can do? So most of the time for our classrooms, each one of the classroom teachers said, well, you know what, we are reading for at least an hour every day, and we have lights that are our um, two-third, one-third switch. And so we decided, well, we can at least cut out two-thirds of the lights while we're reading. We're going to make sure that we turn out the lights when we leave. But as you can see, when we get to the end here, it automatically tabulates everything. And so when you get to the added up summary, you can see for classroom lighting before taking action and then after taking action. So all of that for elementary, it doesn't mean a whole lot. For the high school kids that Jennifer has, it may mean a lot more. The money speaks to everyone, but as you come down, you're going to see it gives you graphs that you can use. And it also tells you in terms of, okay, um, the carbon dioxide emitted by a driving car, you're now saving 5,818 miles. And then as far as a light bulb, um, it just gives you multiple ways so that kids can understand exactly how they're impacting the environment and the potential of what they could do just by making a few adjustments in the classroom and throughout the school. So that's interesting. Any questions about the classroom carbon calculator? Okay, I will say this. If you are choosing to do eco schools, Everyone has to do an energy audit, and what you will need to do also is I would reach out to um, the specialist in your maintenance area. We have a wonderful HVAC administrator, and he came to the school. He gave the kids a tour of everything, HVAC, electrical, even went out to our cooling towers. And then for our post audit, we had to invite in the representative from Alabama Power. Um, Debbie Therrell was her name. She has since retired, but she came in and she walked through with the kids and with our coordinator and was able to tell us, okay, well, you have, we even went through the kitchen. Um, she told us what type of energy efficient appliances we had, uh, what needed to be improved, and having our specialist there on site, he was able to speak to what was being done in our system and what was on the you know future plan and that was extremely helpful because we would not be able to speak to that at all but all that to say the kids also are in a collaborative environment and they see that there are adults that are really interested in what they want to do which i think it it, it spoke loads to them because they were able to go oh wow well this really is important and that's that real world activity and they were able to have a real impact any questions about it? Okay, we're gonna move on. So these are the pathways to sustainability. Each one of them, K through two, three through five, six through eight, nine to 12, audits for each one, pre and post. And um, I will say that we have been working on biodiversity. Once again, everyone has to work on energy. We've also been working on healthy living healthy schools, um, we have been working on sustainable food, water, and schoolyard habitats. But there are so many, as you can see, um, that you can work through when you are looking for some type of um, standards-based activity and also problem-based activity. Okay, so here is another area, um, the Healthy Schools Assessment. This was also done pre-COVID, um, and Healthier Generation is all about um, seeing to not only food needs, but also social, emotional um, connection with parents, connection with um, like your parent-teacher organization, and it gives you action plans. Once again, where am I going to start? How am I possibly going to do this? You have a list of questions right here, so there is no guessing and they are quick to respond. This was done with our CMP coordinator and it scanned not only um, the healthy living group that we have for our system, 
uh, but also just through the schools. They went through the schools and they said, you know what, we're going to reduce the amount of sugar that we have offered for students and also staff. Uh, we're going to look at um, how much time kids have in recess, how much time kids have in PE. Um, they were looking to see, you know, well, what's the morale of the faculty? So there were many, many questions. Uh, what type of professional organizations are your uh, PE coaches involved in? Um, what about your, your counselors? Where are they involved? And so all of that feeds in to understanding if your school is going to receive um, acknowledgement for being a healthier generation school. Any questions about this one? And I'm going to look over here to the chat. Community Collaborative for Rain, Hail, and Snow. So this one was very impactful, especially back uh, in the fall, October 7th. Um, Jennifer, I'm guessing you guys received a lot of rain as well back in October. I think the whole state did. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this. Cocoa Runs, Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. If you don't know already, Coco Ross is a grassroots volunteer network made up of people of all ages who measure and map precipitation, be it rain, hail, or snow. It was started in 1998 in no small part because of the efforts of this guy, Nolan Duskin. You see, the previous year, on the night of July 28th, in the town of Fort Collins, Colorado, it started raining, and raining, and raining, and raining, and raining, and raining. The result was an epic flood that caused over $200 million worth of damage. At the time, Nolan was 20 years on the job as a climatologist. And what did he find when he went to check on his personal rain gauge in his backyard? He found that his gauge was broken. Now a lesser man would have gotten upset. Nolan smash! Nolan smash! Nolan smash! No, I don't think I felt that bad. Okay. So just a very quick introduction of how it all began. And once again, very engaging for the kids because we really don't like dry things at any level. So um, Noel Duskin, Nolan Duskin is the one that began Coco Ross, Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow. And once again, this is one of those projects where you can plug in and gather data as a citizen science on a daily, weekly, whatever level. We have been very fortunate in that um, we, after the fall rain, we had a rain gauge installed on our school. And uh, so now I just log in every morning, I find out what the rain count is, I log that into Coco Ross, and we have been doing this since like 2016. So the benefit of this is that now we have data going back for all those different years. And Coco Ross gives you a file at the end of each year so you can see all of your data in one place. Um, you can use this for graphing. You can use this for your own farmer's almanac and just see what the weather is from year to year. Um, and you can also, there are um, areas for notes that you can write in personally. So you can just write in what the, the low is, the high is, the current temperature at seven o'clock in the morning, which you typically have to do from anywhere from seven to nine thirty. Um, you can put in as much data as you wish that you think that would be pertinent. So once again, your citizen science activity, you're framing it so that the data is going to be useful for you. Um, in this, there are also all types of training videos. So that way that the children uh, can be consistent in what they're gathering. It tells them how to look at a rain gauge, how to read the meniscus. If you have hail, it tells you how to, to look at that. Uh, same thing for snow. So it, it's all extremely informative and uh, it, it's really great. Any questions about this one? So I just want you guys to see that there are other videos. This is the one about how to read a rain gauge. And of course, there's a whole playlist on YouTube that you can use. 
great resources. And we're going to move on. SciStarter. <clears throat> this is a great one um, for a variety of reasons. It can be a one day activity, like if you're looking something for Earth Day, it's great because it also is connected to National Geographic Society. They are connected to Girl Scouts of America. Uh, there are different projects that you can plug into um, that are, you, you can really count on them as being valid. So SciStarter also has a lot of training videos, very, very helpful in the classroom. Alabama Wildlife Federation, oh my goodness, so many resources. Let me pull this up here so that you can see. <clears throat> um, Jennifer, do y'all have a um, outdoor classroom? I'll face this way. Do y'all have an outdoor classroom or a wildlife area, or is this something that y'all are thinking about? Um, it is something I would like to do with my kids. I've been, um, they call me the recycle queen at school because I started a recycling program Excellent. and they, all the teachers send the recycling to me. And then I have like tub, different tubs for every type of thing in my room. So um, but yes, we do try, try to go outside and do activities outside and as much as possible because I love, I mean, I'm sitting outside right now <laughs> watching this webinar. So I love to be outside. My kids love to be outside. So I do try to take them out and, and put them in the dirt, so to speak, so that they can learn because I feel like they learn better like that anyway. Oh, they absolutely do. Okay. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to get you to go at some point to the Alabama Outdoor Classroom Program and on let me click over here to <clears throat> april waltz is the person that you want to contact she is amazing if you have any questions she will just be your guide for everything outdoors but here's something that i want you guys to be aware of there is a planning guide for the outdoor classroom once again you're going oh my goodness i want to start an outdoor classroom how do i even do this this gives you an inventory list questions. There are also um, grants that you can write for, um, but it just has the planning guide over here. There's also activities and lessons to do outdoors, but here's the, suppose you're getting started, how you're going to evaluate your campus, developing a master plan, <clears throat> and then also, you know, very important, how are you going to integrate it into your classroom um, and your curriculum? So that is top notch there. But they also have how to do a butterfly garden as well, which is a little bit smaller, um, a wild fly area. That would be wonderful. Yes, yes. Any questions? Yeah. Now, I, it was funny, uh, even today we took the, we have fences all around the school and we usually have to go through the building and, uh, or through the main building to go to lunch and things like that. Well. They have put um, key card slides on the outdoor fences. So we took the outside of the fence and walked today because it was pretty outside. And um, in the gutters, there's like little trees trying to grow <laughs> in the gutters. And we've been talking about seed dispersal and things like that. So I just look for any, any way to like pique their attention. I was like, look at those trees in the gutters. Like, how did those trees get there? You know, so we started talking about that. And but yes, I, I love to take my kids outside and just look for ways to engage them, whether whether it's really on topic at the time or not, but just to get them outside and get their minds going and working. So that is perfect. Yes, yes. But like I said, this will get you on your way. An outdoor classroom is phenomenal. Yeah, I think that's awesome. OK, um, Junior Master Gardener. This may not be for you, Jennifer, but it does have some incredible activities for the kids to do because it has, um, um, it is based, they can talk about soils, um, mm -hmm. invertebrates. Um, we're talking about foods. We're talking about um, individual projects as well as uh, group projects. And then there's also service learning. So this is just one of those areas that you may want to tap into because you can always take what they have and then um, apply it for your kids to actually a master gardener certification or something along those lines. Yes, yes. Um, but 
chapter by chapter resources. I have my students, my fourth graders are now going through this and we're not gonna finish this year, but they're considering looking at it to, for the beginning of next year because they really are very adamant about getting junior master gardener level one certified. Um, but yeah, great information here. And then um, I think I have, there we go. Alabama Ag in the classroom. This would apply to you, Jennifer. This has some amazing resources, grants. Um, and the point in this is that it highlights all of our state and its natural resources. Um, are y'all cotton growers up there in Valley Head? I keep muting myself because my chickens are going crazy in the background. <laughs> but uh, yes, I'll, I'm in the valley um, in between Lookout Mountain and Sand Mountain. In Sand Mountain, we do have a lot of cotton growers, yes. Okay, so this is perfect because with y'all being in that area where you can absolutely see some of the state's resources <clears throat> as far as farmers, and I know you mentioned your chickens, um, but it just, it relates everything uh, back to Alabama. And I think in this point in our history, especially with grocery prices going up and talking about food chain supply, uh, farm to table, it's really mm -hmm. important that students understand how far some of the food is coming in order to be on their table. And mm -hmm. could we make better choices? And then how would those choices then impact our environment? Or how would it help our own state, our farmers. So then we're talking about economy. So this has far reaching, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it just has a lot of potential as far as going into a variety of areas. And um, Ag in the Classroom, Kim Earwood does a phenomenal job of coordinating all of these activities um, and, and just being a great resource. If you go to, I think it is, ooh, I think it's other ag links. Yes, you're going to find people across the state of Alabama that will be able to uh, to help with you. And I'm just thinking like, when you talk about chicken, I was thinking of um, Auburn and their, their poultry division and mm -hmm. what a, a great connection that would be for the kids. And they have people that will speak to you. They will have people that will, you know, you can do Zoom, Google, uh, Google Hangout, whichever, but yeah, lots of really wonderful resources there. Okay. So the question is, who are your collaborators when you do school um, citizen science? Students, teachers, administrators, look to your CMP staff, look to your maintenance personnel, uh, PTO, and also all those environmental organizations that I just listed. Um, I have never found people to be so quick to respond as all those groups that I just listed. You have people that are, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more, but I'm just giving you groups that I have used and I have personal knowledge of. And I'm sure that um, the folks that will see this uh, and the people that are looking right now will be able to contribute even more. So I'm hoping that this will just be a start of putting together resources so that children in our state will have an opportunity to be citizen scientists and will know what it means to do some real world activities. Um, Dr. Robinson, I'm going to wrap up here. And if you would like to take this slide, I will. Okay. Thank you so much for yes, that. I've been taking notes because you've just made me think about some things that we want to do here in the state and you and Jennifer, y'all are just, just the people we need to make that happen because you're motivated and you're innovators and want to do something to make a difference for your students. Uh, we, we um, you know, when I was at the environmental education conference, we talked about, or I talked about, uh, our having uh, lessons in science 
and science education that's related to Alabama. So when you mentioned Alabama agriculture, what is Alabama ag in the yeah, classroom? Ag in the I class. perked up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we have, uh, what I told them was that we have all these resources here in Alabama. And when we are teaching science <laughs> and environmental education, which go, cuts across, which is interdisciplinary and cuts across all areas, all subject areas, we have the resources here in Alabama and our students will understand it better and will be more engaged if we relate it to local phenomena in our, in our state. So these are just brilliant resources and I'm so glad David put them in the chat so that I can get them, get them all together so that we can start utilizing these. So I really do appreciate this. And when you mentioned the outdoor classroom that April does in the butterfly garden, I, I've been trying to do a butterfly garden in my house. So I think I need to, to pull that information from my home. So that you just gave me so many ideas today on things uh, that we can do. This is why I love uh, these, um, these uh, webinars because you just get information and resources from 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 so many people in the state so thank you so much for doing this so we would like to invite you all to join us uh, next week and the week after next week uh, uh, Drew Middle School in Talladega County will be presenting that uh, they are actually our Green Ribbon School this year in Talladega County has been for years uh, our, for several years, our national uh, Green Ribbon School awardee. The people from the United States Department of Education has visited them because they have so many wonderful things going on in that county in environmental education and are still doing things. So I invite you to uh, join us next week to see what Drew Middle School is doing. And on, um, April 28th, uh, Gulf Coast Sustainability Academy, which is the new Gulf Shores School District, uh, will be presenting. They have a wonderful program of science in the shore, science by the shore, and a uh, small town big garden where they're their classes are actually doing gardening. They're, they're selling the, the, uh, the foods that they are growing. They are using them in the cafeteria uh, uh, for their lunches. And they're bringing in the elementary students from their feeder schools and uh, training them and teaching them. So they have a wonderful program going on there as well. So we are highlighting all these things that are going on over the, in the state of Alabama because we're a secret. People don't know that we are doing these great things here. So we mm -hmm. want everyone to see what's going on in Alabama. So we invite you to participate in that as well. And again, thank you. Uh, Ms. McGowan for doing this for us today. And Jennifer, thank you for joining us. We 